Thanks for accepting the invite. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I mean, you know, movie production, set production, and set design is something that's intrigued us. The two of us are architects, but are not in the movie world at all. But it's it's like the, there are parallels for sure. And if I'm not mistaken, you have a background in architecture. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is very. You know, I've always thought of it as kind of like a specialization in architecture in a way. If you, you know, if you thought of architecture as medical education, you know, you kind of do your first, you know, like a very general mm. study of architecture, and then you kind of go into specializations. People do healthcare architecture, and you know, this. I mean, I guess I graduated from my undergrad in '99, and in India, things like were just changing, beginning to change at them at that time. Uh, architects before were really poorly paid, you know, and at that time, like all these real estate uh, big firms like, you know, Jones Lang LaSalle and all of them were coming in and they were offering, you know, uh, like, I guess, permanent jobs, but, you know, in a big corporate structure, mm -hmm. well, whereas ar architects had always been like firms. So it was at that time, like, you know, they started to branch out. Like there, there were lots of people who were very interested in project management and like that end of it. And a lot of my classmates went into that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think like set design is, I guess if you're, for me, it's more like if I'm just a little bit more uh, more on the creative end rather than the engineering end of architecture in a way. I could see that. Yeah, so yeah. you're not from the United States originally? No, from India. Okay, right. And then, born and raised there. And uh, you moved to the U.S. in 1999, you're saying? In, uh, no, actually, uh, in 99, I graduated from uh, school in India. Then I worked for three years in, in a firm in India. So and, you graduate, your undergraduate degree is in architecture? Yes, right. in India, uh, yeah. And it's like uh, a five-year program. Five-year right program there. Yeah, over here as well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. five-year five if you're going to yeah. be able to uh, get a Bachelor of Architecture and then get a license immediately afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so, such a comprehensive, like a five-year program is so vast it's and so <laughs> comprehensive. <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> you learn, but you also learn so many skills. Yeah. You know, you learn graphic skills. So you know how to arrange elements in terms of symmetry and all of that as well. Just... Just visually, you're, you're, you know, you're trained in so many different fields, which you can then take off and kind of specialize. So did you, so growing up, uh, did you know that architecture was going to be the thing you wanted to study? Did you think you were going to be an architect or how did it work? Well, it's funny. Uh, I always mention uh, Superman, the movie from 1978. <laughs> the one uh, with... Um, uh, Christopher Reeves. Reeves. Yeah, yeah. That's like, I think, my all time favorite the, the best movie. Superman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was funny him. because I watched it as a child, and I think that, and I still don't know if there was this one scene where, you know, he's on a building, yeah. and he kind of, he's like horizontal on the side of a building, and this guy is trying to climb up. Yeah. And that scene just fascinated me. I don't know if that was Superman or it was about the building. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think, you know, I've always, always had a fascination for I think I know the scene. It's not, it's, not, it's not flying. He's just like standing on the side of the building, right? Yeah. So he just yeah. kind of, you know, this this thief has kind of like got these clamp kind of things and yeah. he's climbing along the on the side of the building and he just, he just stops straight there, out, you know, and he just <laughs> waits for him to climb up and look up at him. <laughs> so, I mean, I love that and I always remember that, but I think... At some point, I think it was more a fascination about the building and the architecture and this, you know, glass and steel and mm -hmm. that kind of uh, was the fascination in the beginning, yes. And so uh, you went to undergrad straight out of high school? So you entered yes. undergrad at like 19 yeah. or 18 yeah. or something like that? Uh, 2000, I think, 94. 94 when I started and 99 mm -hmm. I graduated. Very nice. And the under, undergraduate experience was, is it similar to the United States? I have no idea. Uh, I think it's more intense mm. and it's much more regimented in a way. You're not like, I feel like the undergraduate, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I should have <laughs> it, it happens all the time. <laughs> it happened to me a few times, which is like even worse if you're the host. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like in India, I think they concentrate very much on the, on the factual part of it. Like, you know, on this, on the, the data, on the engineering, on you know design based on need and mm -hmm. you know and it becomes I think that it's funny because we grew up kind of you know with Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright and all of that and now I you know almost feel a little disenchanted with all of that you mm -hmm. know in the long run and in India I think for the longest time the education and the, and the schooling and the system of architecture kind of stuck with that 
So there's a lot about, you know, form follows function and, you know, like everything. And then form follows function becomes your guiding principle and, you right. know, nothing else matters and you don't want to worry about the visual aspects at all, mm. even if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of that is definitely, I think it's much more regimented. I mean, here I, I feel like you're allowed to explore a bit more, mm. you know, be a little more, more creative. I mean, you might have an interesting... I felt like that. I'm from France, and I felt like that, too. I studied architecture in Paris, and then I did one year uh, of architecture school in California. Yeah. And that blew my mind away. I was like, these people, they don't worry about the same thing as we have, too, as a student in France. And I was like, why can't we mix it up? You know, why can't we have fun and respond to, like, things that really matter? So it was an eye-opening. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, there's so many different schools in the U.S., but I think there, there's definitely plenty that are much more experimental is like one word we could use right where the more um pragmatic issues that i think you're kind of talking about are like not even discussed at all which is also maybe you know you can go too far past yes i mean i think there is i definitely feel like that education in india it, it trained me in a particular way mm -hmm. and it, it has a huge amount of advantage i mean i can break things down and like you know the way i look at things with a lot more engineering perspective and if that is what is required it works really smoothly right but i feel like at some point when i'm really i i like somebody just wants me to express freely and creatively i feel like you know oh i mean what if this what if i can't build this or what if this thing you know like i'm, I'm hampered by some of that and mm -hmm. especially in a feel like uh, movie making where you know you just want to be completely out there mm -hmm. so sometimes i do feel like i'm restrained a little bit and i would love to like you know even in the even in the movie industry well because of my education yeah. not like i'm restrained uh, uh, okay, from outside okay. is restrained from inside it's I just see. the way i was i was trained to do architecture the way i was trained to solve a problem mm -hmm. i look at it from a particular angle right and i wish i could just you know free myself up and look at it and it happens you know it's just a little harder <laughs> i guess <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, recently I was actually thinking the same thing. So the undergraduate school I went to is probably a little more loose uh, than what you're describing, in part because it was a big institution. So there's many different professors. You could go the easy route, the crazy route, the hard route, the more uh, pragmatic route. Um, but it, it is. But then you know, I, I look over to some of the 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 true artists who are not in architecture and they're doing graphic art or sculpture, and it's like it. You see how free they are to express like emotions and feelings even on a, on a personal level and and trying to figure that out through their work and and i think a lot of times in, in architecture specifically that kind of gets pushed aside somehow i mean i i definitely feel like you know i think in some sense our education and stuff is changing as well i mean earlier once you had a bachelor's degree you know you had something like our parents yeah. for example it was you could live a life out with that you know now I think that your architectural degree is, for example, it's just the base. Mm -hmm. From then on, you need to like kind of go off into your own. It's almost like the architecture. It, you're taking longer to finish your education slowly and slowly. It's right. you just have to maybe you know you do your masters or something. I did a one year masters in Illinois, and that it helped me transition into this movie thing. Mm -hmm. And it was really incredible experience over there too, uh, the university and everything, and the way I was allowed to you know, mix like f classes from film school and classes from, you know, theater, et cetera, to make my own program. Right. And that is the freedom. Like, I think if we allow a certain amount of freedom to the students or something, you know, like, and then let them kind of break it up and see what they want to do. Right. Uh, but yeah, you have to stay within the world of, you know, engineering. You have to, it is, yeah. it's architecture yeah. isn't all just fancy and you know, so well, it's, there's an, I guess there's an inherent like responsibility. <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's a so, very so, big responsibility. So, so you're in undergrad school, and during during your time in school, did you know that there was this kind of friction or this difference between you know what you're discussing and that you would you would finish out the program but then go off to do something else potentially? To some extent, I think there was always. Uh, there was a lot of tension between my designs and my professors. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of those students. <laughs> I was like, you know, oh, I'm gonna want to put this shell roof over it, and you know, like I was just, it's okay if it's big and you know, like difficult to build or whatever. I want to put like tensile structures in India. You know, you build columns, you build brick walls, uh, you know, you build a strong steel, you know, like a, 
framed structure. Mostly, most of the structures are framed structures, and that's oh. you kind of. You know, you want to stay within that world. And yes, okay, you want to put a vaulted roof. It's okay, but you don't want to put a very crazy shell roof because that's scary and that, you know. So I was trying to explore the boundaries a little bit all the time, try to push it. Uh, And I think that, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I was watching a lot of movies at that time. And that was during those five years, I really fell in love with Hollywood movies and all those, you know, the, the typical Rambo and Die Hard and that kind of stuff, like nothing yeah. fancy. <laughs> but I think that both ways, I think like I was watching the movies and I was kind of being inspired by them in my work as well a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be an architect. I mean, for the longest time, and I, even now I think of myself as an architect, uh, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, it kind of somewhere along the way, they uh, there was this movie, a Bollywood movie that they were shooting in our town, uh, and they had built these two massive like houses out of plywood and stuff. And I was like, hey, somebody's got to get paid for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? So yeah, yeah, that's kind of where it started at. And so after you graduate, you worked for a bit in in, in the profession of architecture, right? Um, yeah. And, and so how was that? <laughs> it was good. I it was really it was very interesting because there was this. It was a partnership of two people, and one person he was uh, a professor at the at the local university, uh, School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi, a very prestigious college. But he mm. did a lot of like climate based architecture, you know, like uh, climatically conscious architecture okay. and uh, uh, big buildings, massive townships, etc., like airports and things, you know, and a lot of government work. And the other partner did like offices and corporate interiors and you know so it was a it was a lot of uh, I got to work on both ends of it mm-hmm. you know so it was very interesting I learned a lot and even personally you know I think it was really like an interesting experience with the people and everything and uh, just the I think the the process of actual building you know like it takes so long and it slowly erodes sometimes it does erode away your vision yeah i mean i guess if you're a strong if you're a big enough architect you can kind of you know push your vision through i mean obviously nobody you know changes structurally for frank gary right <laughs> but if you're starting out you know as just fresh out of college yeah. your opportunities are you know as to what you could design and what is your creatively yours is limited mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i think that this the the field of set design really i mean yes the the you know there is a, a production designer who's running the department and there's a director whose vision it is but it still gives you a lot of opportunities to design your own mm-hmm. you know of things to get into creatively and and that's what i really like about it so then you went off off to the university of illinois for a masters in masters in architecture uh, it was, uh, but what I did was I chose uh, my thesis was uh, architecture and cinema. Essentially, what I was my thesis my thesis was my guide to understanding, you know, how you know sets are designed, what are the principles behind it, what's the theory behind cinema. I mean, I'd watched a lot of movies. I mean, that doesn't make me, you know, <laughs> in any way, uh, somebody qualified to make movies. So. I think I just wanted an introduction. I wanted to be able to learn the language, uh-huh. you know, the, the terms, etc., to be able to get into it a little bit. And uh, so my my thesis was one part of it. And then also I uh, was able to, in the first semester, I was able to take a class in film school in new media. And, uh, you know, we, we went through movies like Fight Club and... Uh, uh, American Beauty was one, I think, there. Mm. Maybe not. But there was some uh, new media stuff, and uh, yeah, there was Cinema Paradiso. It was just uh, talking about, you know, what's happening in uh, in terms of, like, how movies are being made and presented in, in the next decade or so, mm. or, like, at that time. I mean, at that time, there, were, uh, there was Atom Films online, if you remember. Atom, A-T-O-M? A-T-O-M, Atom Films. <clears throat> it, it sounds familiar, but I don't know. It was way before YouTube and stuff, and this was uh, 90, no, 2001, 2002. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where I saw, like, uh, there was a lot of Waltz and Gromit stuff on that in the oh. beginning. <laughs> Ardman Animation, they had mm-hmm. a couple of little uh, flicks on that. Uh, you know, and so it was, it was an introduction again into movies, and uh, also in the next semester I took a f- another class in like uh, TV and, uh, you know, 
modern television. So did you ever think about doing a a postgraduate degree more specifically in in film somehow? I don't know what that would be. As opposed to doing one architecture that's, you know... I did not. Actually, <laughs> now that I think about it, you know, like I have, like after that, like, you know, it would have been very interesting to go that route. And I think a lot of schools over here give production design, mm -hmm. you know, school uh, classes and like whatever, they have programs. But, I mean, I'm actually happy that I didn't. It, it was a much more broader approach and I'm coming in from an outside perspective into Hollywood. And, and mm. it's, you know, I bring something new. You're and right. if I'm coming out of the same, like, I think they have incredible schools with, you know, great programs. But I think that there are there's a certain, uh, I guess, a certain school of thought, you right. know, that there are certain design aesthetic that they're mm. kind of, you know, extending. And I see that a lot with the art center. Mm. A lot of students, you know, there's a certain aesthetic and a certain method that they follow. Mm. Uh, they do some incredible stuff. Uh, but, I, you know, it's nice to have people from the outside coming in and, uh, you know, mixing it up. Well, I suppose if you're, if you're doing a master, uh, a thesis and a, you know, master's of architecture degree, you you probably, yeah, have much more freedom than you would if you were <clears throat> going to one of these other kinds of schools that are specifically about film production. I think so. I think that film production, you go in and it's a very specific degree. You can only work in film production. Huh. You can work in TV production, you can work in commercials, but you're only doing one thing. You cannot jump from there and go work for the Navy. I mean, or like, I'm not saying that, it, you know, I'm like, with an architectural degree, I think like you're really, it's very, very broad. I think that you learn, you learn a lot of basic principles mm. of aesthetics, of engineering, of, you know, a lot of things like that, of management. I mean, right. uh, we, we study, you know, we study history for like, 10 semesters, nine semesters, right? And structures for- It's a lot of history. I didn't study that much history. <laughs> oh, we studied history of architecture for every semester. Really? We, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think I had like maybe three or four courses and they were always like at nine o'clock in the morning and no one ever showed up. We had a semester of sociology. We had a semester of, uh, yeah, like, you know, bylaws and like civics kind mm. of things as well. I forgot. Yeah, there was- for 10 years, I'm oh, sorry, five years, 10 semesters, yeah. it's a lot of education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, you should see it as a very broad education because I think that, so this is one of the things that happened was right on the last day of my undergraduate degree, you know, we present our thesis, that was the last thing. And there was this, you know, the 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 professors were in there and there was questions and all of that. And then we were all sitting down in the evening and chatting and these two visiting professors who were our thesis, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, the examiners, okay. they were talking to us at the end of the day and they gave us, they gave me the most depressing <laughs> view of, you know, what professional life in architecture can be. They were like, you know, you're not actually going to design any building. Very few of you are actually going to design a building. You might get to design somebody's house, but you'll never be able to express your own self because the client will want what they want and you're not, you know, actually have a client who's rich enough where you, you oh, know God. you can do whatever you want and, <laughs> you know and it was it was really depressing and i think that that it put me off for the longest time from yeah. architects i think uh it was nothing to do with them it was just this one two people who were just not happy with what they, they were doing they probably shouldn't be in charge of they, they shouldn't be in that position <laughs> yeah. that's like the wrong talk to give to Especially people who are about after to graduate spending five years it was studying. the next day we were graduates <laughs> oh, literally the very God. next morning we were graduates <laughs> <laughs> so but you know I, I think that it's it's a very broad field and i think that you know you can go out there and explore and don't be bound by you know this architecture you have to do architecture just build a building mm -hmm. you can design boats you can design you know anything i mean you could get into car design i'm sure i mean there is industrial design but i'm sure there's a, mm -hmm. there's a route you can you know so i think there's a lot more to it and uh your master's the graduate thesis what specifically was that about Oh, it's just, it was about architecture and cinema uh, beyond, and I, it was, it had a subtitle beyond Maison Saint. Maison Saint. So, Maison Saint is like, you know, the appropriate backdrop for a story, mm. you know, and I wanted to see where architecture was more than just a backdrop, you know, where maybe architecture is a character in the movie 
where it has you know if it's evil or if it if it's <laughs> good you know like what what makes it evil why is it like that and it had a lot to do also you know be, uh, with behavior and how our understanding of certain things are and how the movies play those things up mm-hmm. very easily you know you put a house on top of a hill and suddenly you know that that's you know you're in an exposed situation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you are uncomfortable so you the haunted house goes on top of the hill you put the house in a right. dell and all of a sudden you know it's it's closed it's like a nice farming house you know it's it's quiet and it's got surrounded and it's protected from three sides and you only have one side to look out so you know you feel safe right so that's why the scary movies always have the house in the middle of the woods middle of the and woods like, exposed why? you know <laughs> exposed, yeah <laughs> and uh, there was this uh, I remember in uh, in my graduate thesis graduate uh, school uh, we learned about prospect refuge theory and basically even if you go back to the paintings you know from the 17th 18th centuries it's always about you know you're sitting down and you're looking outward mm-hmm. you know you see like it's almost like you have your your back is always protected and you want that a lot of you know like you feel safe and it's just a human tendency is where you want your back to be protected and you want to be able to look out as far as you can see So I think that that translates in the mm-hmm. movies, you know. You yeah. want to the lesser exposed you are, right. the, you know, the the safer you feel. It's really interesting. But w- so what was it like though to go from India to sh- to Chicago? Chicago. <laughs> uh, had you been to Chicago before? Did you nope. experience the winters? Did you have any idea that it was going to be <laughs> So I chose Chicago because of this professor who had come from Illinois uh, you know to for a sabbatical to teach at my college in India and he opened my eyes like you were saying in France when you came over here you know he opened my eyes to every time we would present our design to him he took one semester of design you know for us and uh, as we would we were designing and we would present our designs he would just uh, basically he he told us to start think about all the things that we were thinking about you know like forget about the building and all of that and the mm. structure and just just think about your concept you want it to be like a flower i was like uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> but it really opened my mind and that was the reason one of the biggest reasons why i chose chicago uh, sorry uh, illinois mm. uh, champaign urbana and uh, the other reason was really the weather i wanted to experience the winter And I knew it was going to be for one year or so, oh, you know. Okay. It was a one year program and I kind of wanted to go off, you know, go to Los Angeles from there. Mm. So in my head it was like, okay, it's one year, I want to experience it. It was the Midwest. It was for me quintessential quintessential America. Mm. Right, right, yeah. right. You know, the the fields, the corn fields, the It's a know. small town, yeah. Yes, oh. yes, it is a small town of I guess 50,000 people. Yeah, okay. Uh so yeah, college town. Yeah, yeah, very typical college town, wonderful place. I I had had a great experience. I loved it uh in every way, you know. I had a very good experience to uh, introduction to America. Right, right. But what yeah. about the winters? <laughs> it was good. It was it was cold. You just don't go outside as a thing. But like, you know, it was like I was it was my first winter, the first time I'd actually like I'd seen snow, but I'd never actually experienced it, you know. Like I'd seen snow, look there's snow on a hill. Oh, I see. But uh, you know, It was fun. I actually enjoyed it. I loved coming out the morning and everything is just covered in white and yeah. all our streets and sidewalks and everything that we built is gone. It was yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. We um we were in Beijing a few years ago during the winter and I had been there once during the summer before to the uh what do they call it? The the, 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 the huh? No, the, the the main <laughs> the, pa- the palace yeah yeah the palace right and during the summer it's it's like it's beautiful oh forbidden city yeah forbidden city yeah. but during the winter it's even it's more magical. amazing one one there's not as many people but also everything's covered in snow and it's it's the most uh scenic thing and you know if you get there early enough there there's, there's no footprints and it's amazing it's yeah amazing yeah But if you live in it for like in New York City, it goes away very quickly. <laughs> it turns into well. Since then, milk. you know, I spent that uh, in 2013 or 14, and there was that horrible winter in Detroit with those polar vortexes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was there through that, uh, you know, winter in Toronto. So you know, since then there have been a couple of other winters, <laughs> yeah. but it's always been very like you know, I'm visiting, and yeah. that's it's okay if you're just yeah. visiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you always knew that you wanted to make the transition over to Los Angeles, right? Um I mean when you were in school. To some know. extent like it was this or like 
I've always thought it was this really audacious. Like, absolutely, I had no idea what I was getting into, and I was being really stupid now that I think about it. <laughs> but, you know, just to move to L.A., you know, uh, I had this whole thing about the visa and all of that as right. well. You know, like, I'm a foreign student. I had one year yeah, on yeah, my yeah. OPT, yeah. Uh, like, my training mm -hmm. program. So I had to make that one year count and be able to transition onto a visa during that one year. And... Uh, that's, I had no tough. idea. That's really tough to do. One year goes by really fast. Yes. And it, so did you end up getting like an H-1B or an h Well, I found the most wonderful friend and, and you know, uh, somebody who's always been with me, uh, Patrick Totopoulos, uh, who's helped me out. He actually helped me sponsor my visa and all of that. Wow. And uh, I've been working with him since then also and we're really, you know, great friends now. And uh, I, I think it was, it was yeah. really lucky that I will, you know, I think it was luck. It was pure luck that I found him and I think that that has a lot to do with it you have to you know at some level be lucky and be thankful yeah for that luck yeah yeah we've had plenty of friends who come over they do school right and they have that one year and uh, it's I mean now the h1b is based on maybe it always was it was based on a lottery system and there's so many applicants it's, it's like, changed it's, actually now when I was it wasn't based on actually yeah, it in fact it's ago. changed many times I think during Bush's era it was based on based on a lottery system hmm. Uh, but before that, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then I think they tightened that now even further now yeah. with the Trump administration. Yeah. yeah, they've really tightened that up. And, you know, uh, there is an O-1, which I learned about yeah. later. Yeah, like you a know? special, so specialized yeah, 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 right. yeah, for artists and, and you know, uh, entertainers and stuff. Uh, but again, you know, it's like I was in the dark and you had to kind of, you know, touch and feel around and and figure out what was going on yeah. and you know every step was kind of an exploration so uh yeah those couple of scary years but you know <laughs> it was fun too it was a lot of fun when i first started here i found myself in the creature design industry creature and design uh, industry. patrick totopoulos he actually is a creature designer and a production designer so he uh one of the first projects i was working on was underworld oh, uh yeah. you know it's those werewolves yeah. and vampires and stuff and I was just the runner in the shop and the, you know, uh, uh -huh. and then eventually I was like the purchasing agent. And then as, you know, when he got his first job as a production designer, not first job, sorry, when he got his job on uh, Die Hard as a production designer, that's when he, you know, he was like, okay, why don't you come on with me and do what you actually meant to do, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, it was, it was fun. And actually, I guess most of my closest friends now are from the creature, you know, industry and, uh, guys, who, you know, we they make puppets and <laughs> things like that. It's just <laughs> stupid and fun. <laughs> so, I, I, there is a difference between set designer and production design, correct? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So, I guess in our art department, you know, in a movie, you have visual effects department, stunts, and casting, mm -hmm. and you know, <laughs> the producers itself. Uh, then you have accounting, and you have a whole art department. The art department kind of deals with everything. Related to the aesthetics of the visual, like, you know, aesthetics of the movie, not the not the camera and stuff, which is, uh, that's all a different thing. But within the art department itself now, there is basically one production designer. And they are overseeing, like, a team of, you know, a couple of set, uh, sorry, art directors mm -hmm. who are kind of the, uh, the art directors are mostly the managers, you know, who, who are we're basically keeping the scheduling and the budgeting and everything in order. And then there's a bunch of set designers and concept artists who are doing the kind of the creative work as well as uh, set designers also transition into a lot of the drafting work for construction, hmm. you know? Oh. So you actually doing all those drawings. So it's like set design and it's what's happening is that, you know, there's concept art, there's set design, there's illustrators, there are all these people who are who are working to create the art of the movie. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of transition into, you know, who's doing kind of what, you know, yeah. now with 3D and everything, it looks like a lot of people who were, who are, you know, you can take your 3D, you can convert into a set, you know, to, to get your renders and everything. And then you can translate that into drawings very easily, right, into construction, or you can take it straight into printing, you know, like 3D printing. So it's like, there's a lot of transition happening right mm -hmm. now. But I think there, there can be like about, four or five set designers, you know, on a movie, on a big movie. Right. And they can be like, you know, another three, four illustrators on the movie as well. 
uh, the illustrators are the ones who do these nice, beautiful, you know, like hand drawn pieces, hand drawn, you know, uh, Adobe drawn kind of pieces mm -hmm. of art, which basically become the thematic guiding, you know, right, the, uh, whatever thematic guiding uh, feature of the movie. And it's all basically the production designers kind of controlling all of that. They are, you know, guiding the whole team as well as talking to the director and getting their vision. Because at the end of the day, it's the director's vision that you want to translate. Oh, gotcha. You know, so it's his movie and, you know, that's, yeah. So <clears throat> all these different people, are a lot of them uh, physically in the same place or are they dispersed and you just send things, you know, digitally? Well, <laughs> it's, <laughs> more, most of the time we are in the same place. Uh -huh. uh, my current job right now, I'm working remotely, uh, but uh, most of the time we'd, we'd rather have everybody in one place. And what happens is that the movie, you know, the moment that the movie is greenlit, you know, once the money has been greenlit, okay, let's go, we're going to make this movie. Then the producers go out and they start to hire people. They, they hire a production designer who then hires his team. You know, we hire, we rent a, rent a space and we, we rent furniture, we bring it in and then we, we bring our own kits in and we, we work. So we, I jump from job to job and from office to office, you know, maybe a couple of weeks to few months to you know nine months to ten, ten, ten you know to right. a year sometimes right so yeah it's it's very it's very much like freelancing mm -hmm. and every job you kind of put your team together but right. you know you the more you work you kind of start working with a few people more you know i work with patrick all the time right uh but you know every time when he's off and you know doing something else i'm kind of working with somebody else as well so the, the transition, though, from Illinois to Los Angeles and you're, you're trying to get into the movie industry, w did you find that it was, uh, like, really difficult to make that transition? Like, were people like, well, like, wait, you have two degrees in architecture, how, how would I? <laughs> <clears throat> I, think, I think the people were very friendly and very response, responsive, you know, to my queries and my emails and stuff. I initially, when I was doing my thesis and I was still in college in Illinois, I... Uh, took my spring break to come over here and to interview people mm. who were part of, like on, basically they were part of the team, you know, who had worked on one of the movies that I'd, you know, listed in my thesis. So I met like uh, one of the art directors from uh, Fight Club, Chris Gorak, uh, and you know, so, and I met uh, Naomi Shohan, who was the production designer for American Beauty. And all of these people, you wow. know, I just emailed them, I kind of found their contact somehow, you know, through their, you know, I guess website or right. Art Directors Guild has a very, you know, prominent website with lots of contacts and stuff on it. Hmm. So, but they were very, yeah, please come over, to, you know, if you want to talk to us or whatever. And they were really friendly. And I think that I spent about three months looking for my first job. Uh, now that I think about it, it seems like, oh, he's three months. <laughs> but it seemed like an eternity at that time. <laughs> three months was very long. Yeah. And I had I had relatives over here so I could live with them, which was really lucky because, you know, uh, yeah. straight out of college, uh, being an immigrant, <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, that wasn't happening. So a, a couple of things fell into place. Gotcha, gotcha. But it was, I think people were very friendly and then there were, uh, you know, people who gave me an opportunity to get started in it, yeah. It's the, you know, because we have always hear these like kind of horror stories about the Hollywood industry and there's a lot of, uh, it's a very cutthroat industry from what we hear. Um, and how much of that bleeds into the kind of work and that you do, you know? I think, I, I don't know, I feel like the art department is one of the nicest places to work. Really because it's like, it's, you <laughs> focus these artists, you know, from different, different departments, from different places together. And it always, it's, it's very different uh, compared to all the other departments. I, I don't know why. Hmm. Uh, it has a lot more representation of women in there. Uh, you know, it's, it's weird because definitely at the level of set designers and illustrators and stuff, we don't have as many women. But you know, at the production designers and art directors, there are a lot of women. Hmm. Uh, I find a lot of people from different uh, countries there, you know, from different backgrounds. So, I mean, I find it a lovely place to work. I, I think it's great. I think Hollywood, there is this, the higher up you go, I, I think that the lower you are, 
which is to say that we are low enough <laughs> and we are away from the firing line and all of that chaos and, and all of that power play that's going on above, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure once you get into the level of a production designer, I've only worked very small stuff as a production designer, but once you get into that, you know, it uh, it must be getting a lot more politi you know, political and mm. a lot more, you know, egos to handle, etc. I'm sure that happens, but uh, yeah, I'm... I'm Mostly insulated from but that. But for now, that's you're insulated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, and then, so what was the biggest, your first big project that you were on? And that you, you kind of thought to yourself, like, this is, you know, a step up from the previous things I've been working with. Well, uh, Die Hard. It <clears throat> was that Live Free or Die Hard, the one which mm -hmm. came out in 2006. It's a great movie. That's, that's uh, a really I was watching it on TV one. a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's, it's, you know, what happens with, this, with the sequels is that when the sequel comes out, you realize how good the previous movie was. That was the one with uh, Justin Long? Yes, yeah, yes. That was a good movie. That was, that was really, good. really good. Because there was a pretty big gap between the previous Die Hard and that one, correct? Yes. Yeah, there was. That was almost like they would kind of given up on the Die Hard for yeah, a little yeah, while, yeah. and they were like, oh, yeah, let's, let's milk this a little bit more and i so. remember because that was when justin long was doing it was it was around the time when he was doing a bunch of apple commercials apple commercials that's and how he got the sense that i think some people had was how is this gonna work he's the apple computer commercial nerd he's gonna be in <laughs> die hard with bruce willis but it was a really good pairing <laughs> we are living in the age of the nerd <laughs> the meek shawl it, it hurt yeah. the world so <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Die Hard was the big one, especially because I'd been a big fan of Die Hard mm -hmm. from the from you know growing up, and uh, also because I got into the union, which is very very critical, uh, you know. In, the union. So in Hollywood, everything is all unionized, almost every really? level. So actors have their union. Uh, directors have their union, uh, and we are all part of the international theater uh, actors, you know, union. There is one. Hmm. Uh, IRC. But uh, so art directors too have their own union. And the thing is that if you're non-union, you cannot work on any mo any union movie, which is almost every studio movie. You can work on indie yeah. movies. Right. Uh, and the only way to get into the union is to work on a union movie. And you cannot work on a union movie if you're not in the union. <laughs> okay. So, it's, so how it's, do you get in? Well, it's complicated because what happens is that sometimes when you're an indie movie and you start out as an indie movie, and you have all these people working, and s then the movie is sold to a studio. So at, in, th in that uh, situation, all the people working can trans transition uh, into becoming union members. I see. Sometimes you can also get grandfathered in. For example, if a production designer says that that is the person and that's the style, and his skills are the exact things that I need because it's such a personal you know, field, right. uh, you then, you know, then the, the producers can then petition the union, like, hey, you know, this person has all the qualities and we're going to pay him the, the appropriate amount of money and all of that. And so that's another way you can get into the union. That's how, uh, you know, I did. Mm -hmm. And Patrick Patrick was the one who got me onto Die Hard and then the producers, you know, got me into the union there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but... Uh, but you, so you can't just apply. <laughs> no, no. And I think now the union is, uh, I think in the recent years I just heard was that they have a, a system where you can kind of become an apprentice, uh, you know, and you, for a little while, you work in art departments and you gain hours as a PA. So my first job was on this movie called Underclassmen. Mm -hmm. uh, Underclassmen. Yeah. It's, Who was in it? Uh, Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon and Sean Ashmore. You know Sean Ashmore? I, he I'm was Mr. Freeze me. from uh, X Men movies. He was the freezing guy. Mr. Oh. Freeze from oh okay, okay yeah, 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 yeah the yeah, freezing yeah. guy the the kid with, yeah. who would uh, not Mr. Freeze yeah 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 I'm trying to talk about um uh, yeah. but yeah, it yeah, was yeah. it was you know it was just another movie and uh, it was my first movie uh, but uh, there I worked as a PA in the art department. Project. And it was very clear what I, I could not draw anything using a ruler. I mean I can sketch something out with a pencil and everything if I wanted to sketch out a little detail, but I should not be using a ruler because if anybody saw that, they could complain to the union and uh, the whole production would be would get into trouble. Whoa. Wait, wait back, be, because if you're using a ruler, that means... You're actually doing the, the, the draftsman job. work. So is the union a way to preserve the sort of the, the, each profession and yes. limit the access to... Not only that, it, pr it protects our, our rights uh, in terms of uh, you know pay. Got and it. in terms okay. of our hours, sure. I think like back, I don't remember exactly, this was I think the 50s and 60s, it got really bad and there were, you know, 
studios had like, you know, just offices and offices of like, you know, set designers just working on different, different shows, <clears throat> but they're all just working together and they just, you know, like own them. Right. So, but I, I mean, the union kind of protects us. It, uh, it makes sure that, you know, you get the right pay you, and you know, you have your different sc scales of pay, mm -hmm. which then the producers can pick from and that's how you negotiate. And of course, all the other rules, you know, when you travel, the hours you work, you right. know, all, all your, you know, whatever you're gonna be provided, all of that comes with it. <clears throat> And I mean, I, I think it's the most incredible thing. I, That's without great. the union, it it would have been very, very difficult, you right. know, to work. And it also helps you find work. It has there's a roster, for example. So every time you're off work, you put your name on the roster, and somebody looking for, you know, a set designer, wow. they just go ask the union, hey, send me the list mm -hmm. of whoever is, whoever is available, and then you can go pick from, you know, one of those people. Ah. So it, it's an incredible thing. And I think Hollywood is one of the last few places where the unions are making their last stand, so mm -hmm. to speak. It's, it's really sad. Yeah. That's, that's something that the profession of architecture should get inspired from. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, you know? come from a big union country, too. Well, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> and, they kind of abuse the system there. That's, that's what know? happens. I think outside the U.S., it's they start to, even in India, it's like, you know, it becomes a reason to strike. Oh, yeah. Over here, you can only strike when the contract's over. Mm -hmm. You know, at the point where you're okay. going to negotiate a new contract, then you can kind of talk about a strike. But in the in between... There's no question of striking. Right. I mean, obviously, if, if there's a production or something who's you know who's blatantly being you know doing something illegal, then you 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 know we can shut them down and the, the union does strike against them. But I think it's it's really good because, uh, yeah, I mean, I can understand it being difficult with architecture because yeah. so much of a you know there's so many firms and they're yeah. small firms, yeah, and they are they are governed by their own you know small business yeah. uh, regulations, so. It's complicated with architects. So, what are the hours like for you? The working hours? Ten hour days. Ten. So that's pretty. That's, that's pretty, pretty decent. That's a good. That's Ten a good hour day. days. You work from normally from eight to like six thirty in the <coughs> evening, and you get mm -hmm. a you know an hour off for lunch, right. and uh, it's it it's it's a but it's, it's a sharp good. cut off at ten hour. Mostly, I think for set designers, yes, because more so. Than anything else, it's like at the end of ten hours, you're not going to get yeah, anything no, productive yeah, from that is, person yeah. because you know <laughs> yeah. you're drawing and you're drawing, and it's I, I've I've done work after that, and I've come back the next day, and I'm like, okay, I've got to redo this. Yeah. you yeah. know, this whole part yeah. has to be just redone because that doesn't look right. And I think once you get into art directing, into production design, then your hours are unlimited, and mm. I think it gets very hectic. Life is very difficult for them. You know, uh, but yeah, I, well, you know, with our jobs, it's very much of a desk, you know, desk job. Unless once you get into the construction phase, then there's a lot of back and forth with construction and okay. you're going back and forth for supervising. But then also at that point, the art directors start to take over some of that stuff mm. because now the drawing's already ready and now they have to just basically translate and make sure everything is moving through. So are you involved mm -hmm. in the construction phase? Like after you design a set, can you actually see like how it gets built and you know, give some feedbacks at that phase? Or is it, that's it, it's off your hands and now? No, both ways actually, both ways. It, in some movies, I see it through and through till the last day before they come in and shoot and everything is all set up. Some days I just do a drawing and I email it off. I'd never see it <laughs> again. So it's it's you know uh, it depends on what the job is. You know, uh, mostly commercials and stuff. They only have a little very short period of time for you. You get like ten days or six days or something to do some stuff, and then you never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. I mean, rather you don't see the the sets mostly. Uh, movies you tend to you know uh, see it through a lot, but. By the time the shooting starts, most of the time my work is kind of winding down, you know, because at least in terms of the individual sets, now, you know, a lot of times we stagger sets so like they can start shooting on some of the sets while the, some of the sets are still being ready. And a, and a big blockbuster movie like, you know, a Marvel movie might have 30, 40 sets, yeah. you know. Uh, some of them are locations and actually build sets. They might have like seven or eight, ten Right. Sometimes, so each set, you know, like as they're being built, they can start shooting on a different stage. And so sometimes I'm there, but most of the time, what happens is that by the time the the sets are built and done, I they don't have, you know, like they've had to let me go. 
because they they run out of money and stuff. So and I have, I have to go find another job. Right. So it yeah, you don't always get to see your sets uh, all the time. But you know, some sometimes yeah. In, until it's in the in the movie. In the movie, yeah. 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 There it is. <laughs> I'm like, oh wait, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Who added that? <laughs> um, so. Hey, we were looking doing some research and you've worked on like a, a whole bunch of different movies and a lot of them are really large like you like the Batman Superman so when you're doing a, a lot of like science fiction action kind of genre um, when you do production for that kind of stuff do you I, I guess that leads you to end up doing more production and more kinds of design for those kinds of movies right everybody in Hollywood gets typecast hmm. Yeah. You know, you start doing one kind of thing, and then you you end up doing that same thing for a long time, and uh, you know. So, was it last year or the year before that? I got to work on uh, Maleficent. Mm. Oh, uh, you know, Maleficent two, uh, the sequel, and uh, I got to design the castle. Wow. So I was like, oh, hey, that is, you know, I go back to my books, look up my Gothic architecture, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> look up all all of my history, you know, bring it all back, right. like, uh, make it actually worthwhile. So that was a lot of fun. It was, you could it just was copy good. and paste something they wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you do end up in the sci-fi uh, world quite a lot. And, you know, th also the thing is that the sci-fi and all these superhero movies, they pay well. There's a lot of stuff to be designed. You know, they have right. to create that reality. Right. So everything has to be designed and, and, you know, and done that way. Uh, now even TV is doing something very similar. I mean, you know, if you... Like shows like Westworld and stuff, yeah. they're huge productions, yeah. and they're they're immaculate, immaculate quality. You know, yeah. like they're all movie quality work. And uh, the one thing I, I mean on Westworld, it was like you know, if you ever saw Anthony Hopkins around, <laughs> you give one hundred and ten percent to your work. <laughs> just play it all. That's it. You know, you just work really hard. <laughs> so, what did you design in Westworld? Oh, I did uh, the second season. I was on it for just six weeks. A couple of uh, they had a, a section of it which was the Japanese uh, town mm -hmm. yeah. where they where they you know uh, the what was it the samurai world or something I think it's called. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, there was that, and which what happened uh, very interesting. And I think they did an incredible job uh, with the production designer and the art director. It was shot up in uh, in Newhall Ranch. And it was basically a Western town, and we just, on that Western town set, we just planted, like, you know, pieces of elements of Japanese style and architecture and uh, converted that whole town to look like, you know, a Japanese village. That's awesome. And they did a really good job. And they were very particular about, you know, which era, which, you know, right. which emperor, which uh, era of Japanese architecture we're taking from, and everything has to be very, very precise. Right. On those things but uh, I think they did a good job and I've done a bunch of those things that yeah I think most of the stuff I worked on was was that stuff so how much research and reading and you know books you have to look into every time you have to design a set where do you find the idea the materials to like create from well we have researchers on our uh, on our movies and you know TV shows as a person who's just dedicated to visual research mm. You know, books and internet and everything, you know. And uh, it's like we might be designing a car or anything, but our research, you know, it doesn't have to be about cars. It can just be fabric or any. Like I'm saying that, you know, the right researcher finds the right kind of information. And it's also, again, the production designers leading that, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that one of the other ways that you can start off in the, in the art department, other than a uh, production assistant, is a researcher, which is that's that's another non-union job, and mm. there you know you can show your kind of you know you show what you can do other than just research, right. and that's another way that you know you can get into, get into it. yeah. Right. That's pretty nice to have research. That's <laughs> really awesome. <laughs> that's I cool. mean, well, because some of these movies are very very. It some of the research is very detailed, mm. uh, and depending on how. The director is. I think that some directors are very, very strict about you know the historical accuracy. Right. And uh, I remember David Fincher was uh, he uh, on Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. He, you know, we were remaking the Scandinavian movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he was particular about one of the offices that they used in that movie. He wanted to replicate the same office down to the the 
the fillet of the aluminum framing in the window. Wow. You know, at like eighth of an inch, he wanted it precisely that uh, very detailed, you know? It, so it depends on what they want. I feel like now, I mean, I think, it, I think it's an interesting point that you, you made with the science fiction movies and kind of superior movies that there's um, more budget gets allocated to the, the design of things because they have to fabricate more more things out of thin air is one way we could say it as opposed to you know, exact historical references. But the, all this reminded me that we had seen the recent Aladdin movie and and of course now in the the kind of cultural hypersensitive environment we live in in the United States, it's like some of these films, you know, they they I'm sure they they feel pressure to be historically historically accurate not just for their own uh for themselves but for the fact that if they get it wrong it could be a problem right people would be very upset like ah that is not <laughs> yeah i mean i think you should be motivated by doing it right the first yeah. time rather than you know being blamed for doing it wrong and i think <laughs> we try to be right of course yeah i mean you know <clears throat> i think cultural sensitivities are very you know it's so critical and even the movie Aladdin and the story Aladdin is, you know, yeah. there's a stretcher already yeah. kind of treading on some weird ground there. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's you kind know, of bold that they decided to remake that movie. Yeah, but it's a, it's a wonderful story. It's a story yeah. that has lasted hundreds of thousands of years. It's a very old story. So there's a value to it. Yeah. I mean, it tells, and as long as you focus on what the value of the story is, and not just the, you know, what it's what the details are. I think yeah. that's unimportant. Yeah. So what was the your, your, the most fun movie you've worked on? Ah, uh, fun movie. I would say Batman versus Superman. I mean, I, I think that... I mean, the, the you craft know, design was pretty freaking awesome. Like. <laughs> well, and, you know, uh, sadly the movie was received the way it was, right. but I think it was a lot of fun. I think overall working and be... Uh, and I think that most of the time, because I'm jumping from job to job, I think my biggest thing is really the people I work with and, you know, friends that you work with and people you get along with and having a good time for, you know, a year, year and a half that you're working with them. So that's, I think we had a really good time. I had, we had a wonderful team of people and had a great time. And then we went on to do Justice League and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's it's difficult to say. I mean, I I remember uh, Total Recall was wonderful. I I really enjoyed it because I got to design, you know, very freely over there. Uh, Justice League because I went got to go to uh, England for that, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, it's it's lots of different movies which are which are good and fun. Do you enjoy doing like the more sci-fi work because there's a little more freedom to to invent and and make up things and. I used to, mm. till I got bored of it. I mean, like I, I did a lot of it. I think, like I then I, I enjoyed uh, Maleficent a lot, uh, you know, because it was uh, a lot of history and stuff that I had to go back to. But uh, last year I did uh, Six Underground, which is still in production. That was very typical Michael Bay action movie set in today's world. But we built this massive three-story penthouse set in Rome, mm. uh, and you know it was fun. It was wonderful. It was great to see, like, you know, we had to go back to being kind of kind of architects a little right. bit because it was a real structure and we got, you know, like it was steel built framework and everything. Uh, it was pouring and leaking rain and everything throughout the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was hectic, but it, it turned out really good at the end. So that was that was fun. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I yeah, I, I always feel like Yes, I want to work uh, on, on uh, sci-fi and it's it's interesting stuff. But then there is a part of me which really wants to work on a meaningful movie for once. I mean, it's all, <laughs> I don't want things to blow up and, you know, like an explosion. I ended up, ended up doing a lot of that. So <laughs> I, I just want to work on a movie which actually has some value and, you know, which tells an important like, story. Like what would be an example? Oh, I, I just love uh, Clint Eastwood's work, uh, oh, you know, uh, like uh, Million Dollar, uh, sorry, uh, Million Dollar Baby, Million right? Dollar yeah, Baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Gran Torino. Uh, Gran Torino is a fantastic movie. Uh, or uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Nolan, uh, Christopher Nolan's work. I mean, uh, Westworld was the closest I got to the Nolan's, uh, you know, but uh, he, he'd make some incredible movies. I think uh, working with Fincher was great. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I wish we were working on, on like uh, original content rather than yeah, something which was a remake. But it was really great to see him work. And yeah, 
Is, is, is adapting and being flexible to different visions something that is a big part of what you do or challenging or makes it fun perhaps? I think it is. Uh, I think that the more adaptable you are to the director and the production designer, because you're working so many with so many different people, mm -hmm. and everybody has a different personality. You know, somebody, some some production designers give me an exact <laughs> sketch, and they're like, "Here, convert this." Mm -hmm. And some people are like, "You know, hey, this is the script. Uh, go ahead, see what you got." Really? Yeah. So it's. I think it's it's a matter of uh, it really helps, and in in fact, just in terms of your own stress levels, I think if the more adaptable you are, the less you know, there's that much less conflict. And at the end of the day, you, in a sense, they are your clients, right? right? So you want to give your clients what they need. It's, I mean, yes, you want to design something and it's, I don't know, I, I feel like, you know, you can push a design aesthetic to a certain point, but after a certain point, it's, I think, it's their building, it's their house. It's their office. I mean, like, you know, even I was talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and, and Luc Corbusier and stuff. I mean, they're wonderful architects and they create beautiful buildings, but the people who own Falling Waters never lived in it. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Le Corbusier's Chandigarh, the city in India, yeah. it's just stretches of concrete yeah, with okay, these yeah. massive out of scale doors, you know, it's so epic and it's dehumanizing in a way. Sure. And somehow like, so, I think it's a concept pushed a little too far mm -hmm, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, you want to make a statement. Yes, that's then that's what the client wants. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and so that's what the director wants and that's what the production designer wants. I would rather, you know, that they get what they need from me. So in the very early concept phases, if it's, if it's uh, run in the example you gave where they, you know, they hand you the script and say, come up with something, um, like, how does that process work? Because uh, so let's say if we think about an architecture office, you might have a kind of charrette where there's 10 different people just producing, just producing a bunch of options. Um, but it sounds like the is with in your case, though, is the team smaller? So it's just a handful of people producing those things and not necessarily. I mean, depending on the size of the movie, <laughs> they can have three different teams that you can just say, OK, here's a script, here's a script, here's just go off and design and then we'll pick one and oh. like and, you know, like it's let's say for example marvel what they they also while they have each individual team for each individual movie is designing things they also have a a, a basic crew which designs their visual aesthetic across their movies hmm. you know so it's kind of but that's something that has happened recently you know with marvel and with them trying to create their world and trying to keep control on it and try to keep the same aesthetic and all of that how did you even do that like what do you how do you keep them consistent i guess it's just well you get standards right but like what are they looking design for? standards well or? it's uh it, it, there's a lot of detail and we uh what we can uh you know all our drawings are digital now and we we from every from show to show movie to movie it's copied on mm. and you know and of course the production designer you know knows how much to take and you know knows that okay from this movie you got to pick that element and studios also store elements now and mm -hmm. pieces of sets which you can reuse you know star wars for example they're still you know using like design elements from the first movies sure. from the mm -hmm. 70s yeah so i mean it's all there it's all the information is there and and it can be you know if you look carefully enough and we end up spending a lot of time zooming into pictures and trying to you know, see grainy pictures and see what's happening <laughs> over there but try to replicate right uh, yeah yeah so you work mostly digitally right or do you still hand draw sketches no not as much uh i use the the cintiq uh okay yeah so i draw uh, on that a little bit yeah, yeah. uh but uh, mostly, I think for me, I most effectively I use uh, 3D Max. Yeah. And you know, I I do lighting and everything in there, and then I bring it in and touch it up. You know, just a couple more highlights and stuff. But yeah, everything digitally. I do in the concept phase, in the early early phase, that there's a lot of times when I'm just printing out stuff and drawing over it, quite a lot, because it's so malleable, and sometimes yeah. I don't have any idea where where I'm going. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean. I think uh, all digital since 99. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's sad. After co in college, in undergrad college, I did everything by hand. And I think I, I 
barely like I think when I was in my fourth year in college, uh, I didn't even know right left click and right click and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> There's two clicks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, most mostly everything is digital. But the thing is that there is still uh, quite a few art uh, sorry set designers out there who draft by hand mm -hmm. still. And they're still used because some directors and some art directors, they just want, there's certain things that a computer will not allow you to design. Mm. And sometimes what happens is that designs start to look like they're designed by a computer. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, and I, I, I don't like, it's just a tool. Yeah. Mm. And we have to understand that. And I think that everybody thinks that learning a 3D software, you've learned to design. And I think that's the flaw. I think that, you know, we we should just use that as a tool. And yeah, and sometimes it does happen. It happens to me that if I start from going somewhere and, you know, like it's just like, okay, let's just offset and chamfer, offset, chamfer. You know, like those are the easy things to do and your design starts to go in that right. particular direction and you don't want that. Right, right. So but what, are, what are some things that you could design by hand that would be, are not possible or really difficult to do in the computer though? Well, I think uh, I would say like, you know, organic architecture and stuff now, but uh, that too with ZBrush and everything, I've seen some of my colleagues do some amazing stuff. But what, what is ZBrush? ZBrush? Yeah. Oh, ZBrush. Oh, I'm surprised you guys <laughs> in architecture school don't. It's a sculpting software. Hmm. Essentially, you basically, you can, you, as you sculpt, uh, it creates a 3D, 3D form. Oh. And you can create caves or creatures or, you know, skin textures or anything you want on it. And you can directly, it creates a 3D shape oh. out of all of that. You can literally sculpt it. Wait, with your hand? With your hand, if you have a Wacom or with the mouse, I see. You can, can be sculpted out, oh. you know. Uh, so it's, I think the best way to define it is sculpting software. Interesting. Yeah, I've never heard uh, of it. I've never heard of it either. I mean, but I'm ZBrush. Maybe, maybe so a lot of people do incredible stuff with ZBrush. It, it doesn't have any... It, no scale or anything like that. It's just, you know, pure sculpting. I see. So what happens is that we get a model every once in a while. Somebody will get a model from ZBrush, which is, you know, like it's just a, a form, even though it looks like, you know, like a room or like a spaceship or something like that. And even it's very geometric, even though, but it doesn't have any scale. It's completely <laughs> off. <laughs> Sounds like a pain I have to translate. <laughs> no, but you know, like if you want to do that kind of work, it works very effectively. It's very easy. Uh, so, I mean, to some extent, there is not much you can do on a, you know, without with a, without a, with a computer now. You can do almost everything. I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, movies like uh, Star Wars or even like some of the other... Marvel movies, I think when it comes to maybe uh, even pro like the prop designs and stuff, like the swords and stuff, even that actually the truth is I have friends who will do that on the computer now. Mm -hmm. So it's really, <laughs> but they're, they're still around. I have colleagues who work, uh, you know, with the hand. I guess it's a matter, as you said, it is a tool, so it's a matter of knowing the tool well enough so yeah. that it doesn't control you. But that's a really difficult, where that line is from day to day and from task to task is hard to know sometimes, I feel like. And that's it. That's where it's very easy to, as you said, to be doing something in the computer, spend a few hours or day, and then realize like, yeah, that is not even where I'm supposed to be going, kind of thing. Because it's it's. I think also, at least in in the designing of buildings, you you know in the end it's going to be in the computer because this drawing set or the model is going to be the computer. So it's kind of like you think, well, if I just start there, or if I just circumvent any hand thing that I might usually do it's going to allow me to get to that final point faster but a lot of times i found that in those moments it's that's not the case like i should have just spent like 10 seconds or a minute just sketching by yeah. hand you know to save me whatever stuff i'm doing in the, in the machine yeah I, I think that uh it's i don't know maybe it's a disconnect between the screen and what you're doing and maybe with with the cintiq now it's easier and stuff but the but cintiq is, is it's, it's a drawing pad right it's like a, it's like a drawing, yeah. It's, it's like tablet. a bigger, it's a larger drawing pad, right? Right. Really, you know. Right. So it can, it can. I think they have a thirty-inch screen as well, <laughs> so you can draw on that. <laughs> but I mean, and, but the thing is that you know, inherently using our hands rather than a, a secondary tool and mm -hmm. then the screen, I think there's there is a disconnect there. We, yeah. we draw much more freely. Yeah. Even if it's a sketch, like which which only we can understand. Yeah. Really, yeah. you know, it's a doodle. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that does help in the beginning. But I also yeah, I think that 
the end of the day, it's experience. And I also like, I guess in school, mm -hmm. how you are taught, you know, and how the principles are more important than just the software, mm -hmm. really. And I know that, you know, yeah, architectural theory and stuff is really boring, <laughs> but it, 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 it matters. It matters for a reason, uh, you know, so. <laughs> Um, and so the most of your colleagues that have the same kind of profession, are they of all different kinds of backgrounds? And do, do you find that there are other people who studied architecture? A lot of people who studied architecture. Really? really? A lot of people who studied architecture. People from other backgrounds, uh, artists, uh, like, you know, just fine art, uh, fashion design, hmm. uh, costume design kind of fields as well. Those are the mostly those are the people really. And but there isn't really actually a qualification that is required. Right. I mean, if you can draw and you can draft, you don't have to have a degree or anything to right. work it. Yeah. Are, it's fascinating to me that there is actually, I mean, it makes complete sense, that there is actually drawings for the the set, like construction drawings for yeah. those things. Yeah, yeah literally construction drawings, <laughs> with, you that's, know. That's really cool. Like, I would love <laughs> to see, like, what that looks like, you know, because it's... it's a little just, different uh, <laughs> from uh, architectural drawing, only in the sense that the notes and the, the, note, the annotations on it are all about, okay, this is where the actor enters in, or this is where the motorcycle oh. will crash in over here, and that, this element is breakaway way or this you know like those are the kind of notes that i'm putting in there that's that makes it different from an architectural drawing really but you don't have to think about the materials that would be used to to build the set or do you have to you have do some idea? you you have to i mean be mostly like all stage sets are mostly built out of plywood yeah mm -hmm. and you know and a framed structure uh but uh you know i think like when it comes to like these cars and stuff like i i know that you know the 3d model is going to be used for printing out the, yeah. the the outer form and then they they put in the fiberglass and all of that and that's how they're going to manufacture it sometimes uh like the set i was telling you about six underground in in rome it was an exterior it was built outside so and it was a three-story structure so we had to have a steel structure and a steel frame in there complete and a lot of it was real you know like it was all real glass real framing real aluminum and all of that so that was uh completely like going back to architecture yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> that's pretty wild that's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, except that it poured and it, and it just i think like two days before the shoot it like what what happened was uh we didn't put any slope for rainwater drainage uh, on this go. big set and uh we were like, okay, you know, we were worried about it from the beginning, but the construction guy, you know, their their department, they were like, yeah, yeah, when we do the final, when we lay this, the travertine in, we'll just put the, you know, we just slope add in, that yeah. slope in. And that never what happened. And the oh. whole water was coming around from everywhere. <laughs> 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 so, you know, stuff like that happens and it's a learning experience. But, you know, also we were limited by time and yeah. we have to build the set in three, four months and it has to be finished and ready and then it has to be easy to tear down oh that's interesting. interesting yeah yeah because the moment we are done we have to tear it down and clear the side up and give it back to the people who own it you know the way it was that's right because i guess in, in these kinds of productions you have to have, a, have to have a very light footprint if you go around mucking stuff up permanently it would be a, a big problem <laughs> yeah uh what happens is that if uh and it actually does happen quite a lot is that if you go to a you know, a location shoot, you know, let's say, and we want to build a particular wall, we want to paint a particular wall, we want to change the floor somewhere. We can do that a lot, a lot of times with the, essentially the deal is from the people who own the property that, you know, just restore it. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to pay to repaint it back to what it was before and all of that, yeah. Do they have, ever have uh, times where the owners just say, you know, just leave it, and this will be like a remodel for me? <laughs> Sometimes. I think there was one movie where we, we painted a basketball court outside for a thing, and they just wanted to like, leave it on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, we were uh, watching Game of Thrones, um, as everyone else has. <laughs> if, if using Game of Thrones? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they had this, you know, the, the extended, like, extras um, documentary. document that we saw. And, you know, they constructed... Uh, in, in the final season, they have the big fight scene of, of in what's the, what's this what's the town called, the capital, whatever, right? Oh, yeah. but there's a main yeah. street where like all the action happens, and they constructed the street. And when you're watching it you, and now, sometimes maybe you can, but I I can't quite tell if it's CGI or real. 
and then you find out in in the this extras feature that it was a real set that they built and as marina was saying like it, it makes sense that someone have to build it but when you think when you see it and it's like it's a full construction it's like this is insane how quickly they have to do it it kind of it's it's really bizarre it's really everything bizarre. happens really quickly it, it happens i mean i think 12 week lead time for a set mm. is huge <laughs> really uh, yeah it's it's a good good amount of time to build a set like you know uh like a, if there were like four walls with you know interiors finished all of that the you know, flooring ceiling uh but uh Wait, sorry, <laughs> my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, <clears throat> so, but when, so when you're going to watch movies, are you able to enjoy like the the scenes, or is, are you in your mind? Are you trying to pick apart and figure out how they did it? Uh, I still enjoy movies, <laughs> uh, but I can see the set if yeah. I, you know, there are certain places where I can see the set, and I can see CGI, whatever is computer yeah. generated. I can very clearly see that. Even now, even with like, I don't, I don't know what what's a really good siege. I mean, the End Game or any of the Avengers movies were pretty, pretty high quality. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> it, it actually is weird because like I remember when you know I don't know I'll name a movie. Oh, okay, let's say like one of the first Hulk movies with uh, one of the previous Hulk actors, right? At the time, you could tell it was not real, but in, in the theater, I remember thinking, well, "This is pretty like this is pretty real." You can tell. It's not totally legit, and also you know because it's the Hulk, but still looks pretty good. Now you look at the film, which is maybe ten years old. It's the most phony, fake thing ever, and I'm yeah. very curious to know. It ages very fast, and no. that's the thing that CG, everything that's computer generated, ages pretty fast. And even if you now, if you look back at movies where they've used uh, miniatures, mm -hmm. for example, yeah, you'll see that the miniature actually holds up better. Yeah. You mean it like looks models? like a model, mm -hmm. you know, like a scale model yeah, yeah, yeah. of a city being yeah. destroyed by a wave yeah. or something like yeah. that. The thing is, there you know it's a miniature, but you still kind of go along with it. Hmm. The CGI, it suddenly, like I don't know, in my head, it's like there's something off about it. Yeah, you've heard about that thing called the human paradox. Mm -hmm. Well, it's this thing in the movie. What happens is that uh, when you create an animated character, if it looks very close to you know if it's oh, really yeah. really close to being human right. it throws the audience off yeah because uh, it's too much like a human but we can see that it's not human and it's just we, we get bothered by it a lot right so i mean as far as i mean as far as creating animated creatures and all of that that is one one thing but for me, it's more about the inanimate objects and the inanimate surfaces that, that surround all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think they've done a very good job. But the thing is, again, yeah, it ages so quickly. Yeah. It's like in the theater, yeah, I mean, I can definitely say that sometimes it's difficult for me to tell. But if I'm watching the movie again on, a t on TV, you know, after a little while, it, it, you can immediately tell. I'm spending more time to be careful. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's easy to, to demarcate that. And it's getting better, I think. The computer generated stuff but uh also we are getting clever about how we transition as to what's real and what's not real mm -hmm. so where we, we put our transitions and how we do that mm -hmm. that the the better you do that the, the lesser you can tell you know what's real right what's, yeah right, right so does the set that you design are exclusively like built in real life or do some are used as cgi sets in some movies uh, sometimes I'm designing just the portion which is the set and okay. everything else CGI somebody else is going to do. Okay. Sometimes I'm designing this whole thing like so Maleficent the castle, I designed the whole castle inside out and everything. Now that, you know, we're only going to use little bits of it, you know, there's a balcony and then the, everything else will be shot for, okay. you know, on CGI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we're only going to build like little portions of it, you know, all around. So. I mean, yeah. So my my asset is then used by other departments, and you know, to to go on to create the whole thing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Do you ever have something you designed, and then you see it in the in the theater, or you know, you're watching the movie or the TV show, and it's like drastically different? Oh you yeah. Can tell. <laughs> <All the time. laughs> you can tell it still came from you, but it's like, no, wait, wait, what happened? Like half of it. Well, by the time the movie comes out, and my job is done and like, you know, maybe a year has gone by, six months, nine months, a year mm -hmm. sometimes. So that's people's own ideas have changed and the director's ideas have changed mm -hmm. also sometimes. And, you know, like 
it's if they find a design that looks better or something that works, it's totally, yeah, happens. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, so what's a, a, a recent uh, movie or TV show where you, you were it's like super impressed by the set design, production design, like some something that you saw you, you felt like uh, kind of looking up to in a way? I thought Westworld, the first season, you know, uh, I thought it was very impressive because they had done so much with so little and mm -hmm. they had redefined some things in like the office, you know, all yeah. their office environments, there's just glass yeah. and, yeah. and yeah, frame. And even this idea that, you know, every time I always find it really boring when the, when the camera moves towards a computer screen and you're doing something on the computer and they're looking at it or, you know, it's, it's not as interesting as, you know, if you're moving uh, an equalizer up or something and you're doing something physical, you know? Right. So I think that what they did with the computer thing in there where the person is just sitting and they're looking at a blank, like at air, and they're kind of reading off of their glasses, mm -hmm. you know, whatever is being listed. But I thought it was interestingly done. It, it didn't, you know, didn't stand out. Yeah. Uh, but, I think that that was very well designed. Uh, what else recently I've seen? I thought Mad Max oh, was beautifully Max. designed. Yeah. Yeah. That was a beautiful. That's such an intense movie. movie. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. three and a half hours. It's like a. It's like but a they're workout. taking you know like the, the steering wheel for example. The cars, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, yeah. there's so much pain and effort taken into that one little detail. So and the yeah. guy that had like the flame flame thing, the, <laughs> the flame thing, the, 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 the guitar, guitar. <laughs> guitar. Yeah, that that I I mean that movie was that movie was epic. We, we, epic is the good word yeah. for it. And also, a lot of the things that were designed in it were like plausible, mm -hmm. right? Plausible enough, but uh, but it, it was you know on that threshold very well. I felt like like other types of post-apocalyptic movies, at least for me, and maybe it's just the, the designer's eye, when they have, you know, flame contraptions or whatever, but they don't make sense. To me, it's like, ah, but this, why would they, there wouldn't be all this extra tubing, like, it doesn't make any sense. But in, in Mad Max, it like made sense enough to where like, you, you know, I buy it. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. So yeah, I buy it until it's cool. <laughs> I think some movies, they, uh, it's the sense of design which really transcends time. Mm. You know, if you look at Alien, for example, <laughs> It, it can be a futuristic movie today. It, yeah. it was a futuristic movie back then. It hasn't aged. Yeah. You know, you look at some of the other movies, uh, even 2001 Space Odyssey, it, I think I think the story hasn't aged, but mm -hmm. the movie mm -hmm. definitely, you know, starts to age a little bit. Uh, like I think, uh, for example, James Cameron Terminator, mm. I don't think it'll ever age. Yeah, I don't you know, even anything. with those visual effects and stuff, it was, it looks a little hokey and corny right now, but it, I think it's, totally fine yeah. it, it works really well on the other hand avatar i think will age really fast <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> i haven't seen it since when it, when it first came out but yeah if it you watch it on tv it looks like a, it looks like somebody just there's a lot of color in it <laughs> <laughs> they have another one or two coming out i think right? there's one it, coming out yeah. and uh i think it's going to be amazing i think he's going to in the theater, it's going to be amazing. I yeah. think it's a ride, yeah. and what he promises, he gives you what he promises. You know, it's all about the ride. It's not meant to be watched on a TV. Yeah. And I think definitely it, it raised the bar for movie making when it did come out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it changed the industry quite a lot, and I think the next one also will. You know? Yeah, because it was kind of the first. I mean, recently there's a big uh, in the news, the headlines is, is, is Marvel's Endgame going to beat in the box office? Uh, <laughs> we were just talking about Avatar. 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 And then, and I guess it did in the initial release, but not in the second release in the theaters. Um, but yeah, when Avatar came out, it was like people went to see it because it was understood that it's, it was something new. Yeah. Yes, it, it's it was an experience. Right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I saw it in 3D in Chicago. Uh, the, th the 3D wasn't really well set, so it was kind of a painful oh. experience. <laughs> but I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> but you know, I think that, yeah, he and then a couple other directors, what's his name, Ang Lee, mm. he, they're mm. trying to, I think it's about understanding 3D, really. We yeah. don't understand the medium fully. Huh. I think in Life of Pi, mm. to some yeah. extent, he understood it. Mm. Yeah. You beautiful. know, because you don't, like, it's not 3D. Like the whole movie is 3D. Like, you know, you, what, what I'm saying is I think you should use the 3D to tell the story or to enhance it, not just put the movie in 3D and, yeah. oh, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. I think yeah. it has to be used effectively. And I think we're beginning to learn to do all of that. And I'm sure when, when Avatar comes out, the next one, it'll be a whole be step up. And Yeah, because for a bit of time, I felt like everything, 
it was really obvious when you were watching a 2D scene, and then oh, now it's a 3D scene. Yeah, and then back yeah. to 2D yeah. scene. And the 3D scenes, there's always like very clear planes of existence, kind of like okay, now I'm, you know, the bush or the tree is in this plane, and the car is in that plane, and be like, but is this really doing anything for the movie and the story? Like I don't know, just, things are shifted more, but it doesn't seem to be bringing anything else. <clears throat> Um, so who is a, is a director or like, what's your dream project you'd like to be on? Oh, uh, right now. I, I, like I said, Christopher Nolan, I'd love oh, to work with him <laughs> or Guillermo del Toro. Mm. Oh. I always love his set because he's so visually, he's, you know, some directors, and that's kind of funny thing is that some directors are very visually strong and they know exactly what they want, which means that you might not get much to design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you see their movie and comes out, you'll be just stunned. You know, like I think Fincher, Del Toro, even Tim Burton, you know, he has this particular vision and uh, they're very, very strong on that and they want just that. But there are other directors who will totally allow you to explore, you yeah. know. So, yeah. Huh. I, I would love to work with them, definitely. <laughs> but also, yeah, I'm always torn between you know doing fun stuff. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's it's all about you know you, you make money and it's a job and you're trying to you know uh, it's sort of living. Right. I, mean, I imagine it's a lot of because it's it's per contract, it's project based work. So you're you know having to always line things up and keep track of what's in the pipeline. Yeah, I mean, I would say lesser now. Mm. I think. Now, the, the, you know, after a few years of, it's been about 10 years or more that I've been working now. So, you know, enough people that you're almost like, you know, you turning down jobs mm -hmm. in a sense because you want some time off. So, I mean, now it's mostly like, yeah, I don't really have to, you know, go out and seek it. It's just in time, it becomes comfortable enough that it comes to you and you just, yeah, you just want to take time off and not travel or something like that, yeah. It's a good spot to be. <laughs> Would you do uh, um, design for like video games or even like Broadway performance shows, like things that are somewhat related to movies, but not really movies? Well, I haven't had a chance to as yet, uh, but I would love to. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, just at the begin at the end of last year and beginning of this year, I worked on an architectural project. Hmm called Neom. It's a new city that they're building, or they're supposed to be building in Saudi Arabia, along the Red Sea coast. And they they wanted Hollywood, they, they had like five or six different teams across the world coming up with ideas. And one of them was a Hollywood, you know, team to come up with their own kind of ideas and stuff. Whoa. So it was interesting, you know, for about, what, three, four months I was designing. Uh, what is that called? Uh, Neom, N-E-O-M. Oh, wow, well, I haven't heard of that. It's a, it's a city, it's like, Three hundred billion dollars or five hundred billion dollars uh, over the next fifty years. Wow. It has some huge geopolitical considerations. Apparently, like if they build that city, Saudi Arabia is going to recognize Israel. Uh, you know, so it's it's kind of like, and it's also related to very much to that prince uh, over there right now. <laughs> And it's like his his best pet project, right? Right, uh, his legacy. But I think it was more about you know just coming up with some weird ideas, some cool ideas for a futuristic kind of city and stuff. And so yeah, I got you know design architecture. <laughs> and, and they just and they specifically like decided we're going to have these different types of teams uh, submit proposals. I think so. I think they had two teams in Hollywood coming up with ideas. And I think they just wanted to explore you know right. what's out there. I think they had one team in Spain or and. Uh, Two other teams I don't remember, but uh, I think they just wanted a Hollywood kind of expression, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it, you get yeah. to see the other en entries? I guess no. you're coming. Oh, I didn't see I it. Say, now, I bet it would be really interesting to see everyone's <laughs> submittals yeah. for the for that. Yeah, for I'm that. sure that. I mean, I guess because it's Saudi Arabia, I don't know if there's a website for uh, it. <laughs> I don't know. Somewhere. I mean, it was interesting because the way they they presented their idea. You know, uh, in there was like a, they had made a little video and like you know that because it's a big government thing. So I'm sure they, they made a little video and it was all about, you know, a place which will be free, which will, you know, have no restrictions. And there were like women, you know, walking around in parks and kids running around and playing. And it was supposed to be like this, you know, very like an open zone, open uh, open market kind of zone mm -hmm. in within Saudi Arabia, like in, mm -hmm. uh, along the coast. But uh, I think from what I understand, as the 
the things got further and further, they were like, oh, yeah, but the prince is not going to live in that house. It was supposed to be a very equal opportunity. Everything was all supposed to be very equal. But slowly, they started to deviate from that. Right. Right. And it's funny, like, you know, it was almost a city designed with any poor people in it or, like, any any facility, you know, for, like, low-income housing. And yeah. how, how does no city exist like that? No yeah. reality yeah. cannot exist, you know, like that. It's like, naturally cities evolve to have that yeah it would have to yeah. be a, a Truman show kind of situation yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean they're talking <laughs> about a gated beginning. city you know yeah, like yeah. Just close yeah. it off but even then at the level of a city no matter what you do it starts to grow on its own yeah and i think that as it grows it it takes on you know different status of society come in and everything happens. You cannot design a city which is completely only for rich people. I mean, how does that work? <laughs> and just a lot of rules, I guess. I mean, I, I, I mean, yeah, then it gets into like dictatorship basically is what it is. Even that, what happens is that then you all you're doing is ignoring the reality of the situation. Yeah. I mean, I always thought that, you know, like whenever I design, I'm designing a moment in time and in the movies, like I'm designing a building, which is a moment, you know, it's like, let's say, I always think about India, like, you know, a building which has got clothes hanging on the outside, drying, a building which has got streaks of black, you know, from the rainwater coming down, a building which has got an addition done on a window, which was kind of blocked up. That's a real building. I mean, yes, in the beginning, we designed this beautiful building with this perfect illustrations of people and families walking around. But in the truth is that mm. the building then takes on a life of its own and cities take on a life of its own. Mm. And that, and it's fine, you know, they, they become alive and they have their own character and their personality. And I think that's what's interesting is that I'm able to tap into that one right. moment. Right, You're 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 creating something that's like, kind of midway through its life or whatever time in his yeah, life. Because even the actor, for example, he's only portraying a particular moment in their mm -hmm. life and a particular, even particular part of a personality of a person. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, no no character written is so multidimensional as to represent a real character. I mean, we all have so many more attributes to ourselves than just, you know. Yeah. yeah. That is really interesting, actually. And um, on that, this was a f really interesting conversation, and hopefully in the future we're going to get you back on. Have you been to the Disney <laughs> section? That just no, opened, I have never been to yeah, Disney. Yeah, okay, Land. you should go, and then we'll have you back on. You can tell us <laughs> okay. what you think of it. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I have never actually been motivated enough to go to Disneyland. That's... You've never been to Disneyland? Uh, no, the crowds uh, really bother me <laughs> a lot. It's kind of intense. Yeah, it's, I, I yeah. guess I guess people are saying now actually that it's a good time to go to Disneyland and see everything else in Disneyland because everyone is just going, going to, to Star, Star Wars. Wars. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. So I'm st still probably pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's an actually architecture is an interesting place. And theme parks is something that I have a kind of a fascination with because they're they're kind of also this, you know, they're realistic. They're real because they're constructed, but they're also not real. Sometimes they have to meet code and they're occupiable. And other times they're just background. Yeah. And it's it's a very uh, it's an interesting. Actually, you know, the theme park analogy would apply to this this uh, the city that you're, the city on the coast that you're talking about because it's a it's a fiction it's a yeah it's a yeah place it, it, it's I mean at least from the beginning it just sounded like a fictional place yeah. I mean yeah. it's all wonderful you have these amazing transportation systems but yeah. we were almost it's like you know we're not really there yet and there has to be a certain reality mm. you know that comes sets in but uh, it's yeah uh, theme parks actually I just want, want, wanted to mention uh, the in my uh, Alma Matter in uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, mm -hmm. there's a, a class that uh, Professor Anthony, Catherine Anthony, she takes in architecture, in cinema, mm -hmm. and she explores not just, uh, you know, like behavioral aspect, aspects and the, and the psychology of movies and, you know, and how architecture is depicted, but she also talks about architectural uh, tourism, movie-based tourism in a way, you know, oh. like uh, Lord of the Rings, right. people going to Switzerland for, for seeing, you know, the Sound of the Music yeah. tours and stuff. And she talks about theme parks and mm. stuff and movie-inspired architecture and restaurants and stuff. Uh, interesting class, yeah. It's very it's, broad. It sounds like and, your job is just a lot of fun is what it sounds like. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot like playing with toys. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy it still, yeah. It's awesome. All right, well, thanks, man, for coming on. I had a wonderful time. Thank
thank you so much. Lovely meeting you guys and uh, best of luck. Cheers. Yeah, thanks I'm glad so to be back. Well, 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 how was that? I mean, now you all regret you're stuck working at architecture offices and you would rather <laughs> go design movie sets. <laughs> hey, it I'd is rather, that too late? I'd you rather be designing it. Batmobiles and Batwings. How fucking awesome is that? And castles and stuff. I was looking I mean, at his resume. He also worked on The Hangover, Terminator, Captain America, Winter Soldier, Passengers. I mean... Maleficent too. He did the uh, castle for that. Oh, man. So the possibilities are pretty wide. You yep. don't have to get stuck to designing bathrooms your whole life. So that's the good news. The bad news is the episode is over. <laughs> okay. So you're going to have to tune on the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you should do now is stay on your phone, your computer, whatever it is, go to the podcast app and leave us a review. That would be really appreciated. It means a lot. Uh, we try to get as many as we can, but it's, it's tough. And if you do it, then extra gold stars to you and good karma. <laughs> and we'll feature you on our Instagram stories. So Will we? Maybe. Well, if it's good. Maybe. To give us five stars <laughs> and you say how much you love us, that we will. Yeah. Uh, we have a website, midnightcharrette.com, and we are on all the social medias. Reach out to us via any of those and tell your friends about this podcast. Thanks much for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye. Adios.